We invited all animal advocates from around the world to explore important and complex topics. Through respectful solution-based dialogue, we attempt to find common ground. Welcome to another episode of Common Ground. I'm super excited to share this episode with you. It's one of our most robust conversations yet, and it actually went a bit long, so it's going to be split into three parts. So be sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram and hit that subscribe button so you can see the other episodes. With that, let's start the show. As animal advocates, we want to advance the plight of our fellow animals as fast as possible. But what about the overall strategy, and how do our tactics fit into this? What campaign should we be dedicating our limited time to? Should activists be encouraged to live vegan? Mm, yeah, we, we, did a, we did a previous show, didn't we, Jeremy, where um, we, uh, we had um, Bernie Wright from um, a Dublin-based group called Alliance for Animal Rights, and um, she was organizing um, the Shelburne Park uh, Greyhound campaign. And she said or there was a bit there was a bit of um, pushback when they tried to do like a vegan picnic. And ironically, it seemed to be the vegetarians who were pushing back more than anybody else. But um, th- she does report that um, quite a lot of the people or some of the people have kind of expressed interest in veganism now. So, again, it feeds into that kind of That's debate. That's interesting to say that about a greyhound group, though. Sorry, just to say. But with my local, this particular group, they were quite... Uh, pushback by people that were known as sort of like uh, hunt saboteurs or or vegan because we would we would talk a bit like there was a quite a few vegans in the group but ultimately a lot of the people that were vegan activists or animal rights activists but who were vegan a lot of them got pushed out of the group because they weren't made not to feel comfortable because a lot of people there were weren't so like the the leader of the group wasn't vegan she was vegetarian but she ended up it's it's interesting though with those sort of single issue campaigns is because there's a lot of non-vegans there and it goes to show that there are people that care about animals but then when you start talking about um veganism or as in having a plant-based diet they can really get funny about it it's, it's quite mm. bizarre how common is it for greyhounds to be forced to race so, I mean, Ronnie, you, you did greyhound campaigning for many years. So what, what was the story with, with your experience? With regard to greyhound racing, I was involved with in, uh, for 13 years. Um, my wife, Louise, and I, we set up the first um, uh, group in the UK to campaign against uh, uh, greyhound racing, which was called uh, uh, Greyhound Action. Um, and, and it was mainly to do with um, holding uh, protests outside tracks to educate people uh, not to support greyhound racing because most people going to greyhound racing weren't particularly, you know, I wouldn't say they're cruel people. They were just people going for a night out. So it was a way of like removing economic support from an industry that was to be quite honest, was already struggling. So it it had taken away a, a section of their support meant that quite a few of these tracks actually went, went under. Um, and uh, there's not there's not, many, not many left now, is there, Ronnie? No, they're, they're, I think there's I think there's been three closed in the last month, um, uh, including uh, Bellevue, which is a track in Manchester, which was probably the most popular track mm. in the country. Um, and it's uh, yeah, I mean it's uh, it, at one time they were about 120 uh, greyhound tracks operating in the country. And now there's probably only about twenty now. I'd say it's 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 really it's really been been reduced. And that it, that was a kind of effective campaign in terms of identifying what was it that was keeping the industry alive, and actually putting pressure on that point. You know, mm. and actually kind of but cutting what, off. What, what about what about this specific point about people joining who were not vegan? Uh, who oh yes, vegan, or or people who were running it, not being vegan, and that ostracised the vegans. Did you have any of that? No, we, ne- we, we, we never had any of that, to be honest. I mean, we were, we were vegan that ran the campaign. There were people in, involved in the campaign that, that weren't vegan, but there was, there, was, there was no problem about any, because they were kind of local, obviously sort of local groups and, and, and local campaigns where people uh, protested against their local tracks. And to be quite honest, a large number of those people were vegan anyway. Um, so there was there was never um, that problem. Um, I mean, I had I, I had the, the the kind of 
sort of reverse experience myself many, many years before when I was involved in the Hunt Saboteurs. We had a Hunt Saboteurs in, group in North London. And um, the, the kind of three people that ran the group were, were vegan, including myself. And we, we, ha we had a lot of people joining and uh, almost always the, the people that joined, joined weren't vegan or, and weren't vegetarian. And when they, first of all, when they heard we were vegan, they'd say, oh, we're not interested in that. You know, we, you know, we enjoy eating our meat and we're just, we're just here to, because we want to save the fox. Uh, that was that was their attitude they were you know most people were kind of quite resistant when they heard we were vegan but but most of those people within just a few weeks actually went vegan from just rubbing shoulders with us and uh, be, because we were able to explain to them the reasons for veganism mm. and kind of help them become vegan or, or, almost everyone that joined our group uh, yeah well I, th vegan. I think there's a lot of there's a lot of evidence it seems from all over the world even that that this process that becoming activist first and then becoming vegan um i mean wendy i think i think mel broughton would, would would say that 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 seems to be a process that works the the real the real issue for for vegan education people is whether you've got to as it were downplay the vegan stuff at first in order to you know how how you know, we i was always kind of think okay well even if you wanted to go with that model, how would you practically do it? I mean, I would have to change the name of the Vegan Information Project, presumably, because that's going to that's going to put people off originally, who might or might subsequently become vegan, but not at first. So, you know, there's a, there's a there's a kind of um, it's almost you get involved with tactics or politics, or as I always believe in being honest myself. But uh... why is it that greyhound racing is less popular than horse racing? Is it some sort of cultural speciesism that dogs that it, it, exploiting dogs for racing is is somehow worse than horses or i'm just curious on that and perhaps classism factors in there too mm. just because horse racing tends to be associated with kind of higher is it is it not status. just because it's a smaller industry full stop or something like that it used but, to be it used to be more popular than horse racing at one time um uh, it's been uh, um greyhound racing was very hard hit when uh, the in, in the UK anyway, when um, the betting laws were reformed, I, I think it was in the 60s and people were were uh, were allowed to go into betting shops on High Street because prior to that, uh, the only place they could bet was at the track. So people that wanted to gamble would have to go to um, Greyhound racing and Greyhound racing was very popular because it took place a lot more frequently than horse racing. I mean, horse racing only takes place at each of the horse racing courses it, it kind of only takes place you know every couple of weeks or something like that perhaps or less than that whereas uh, greyhound racing can take place three or four times a week at, at, at a dog track and so it was a very frequent way that people and this was this was kind of mostly mostly men people didn't go as families it just it, men would go and stand in the cold and drink and smoke and gamble at, the, at these dog tracks and it was very popular and it, it, it was dealt a big blow when people were just allowed to go into a betting shop and place a bet and that was kind of when the, the dog racing industry um, went into decline and I think there's less money I mean it does rely that it, it, it was poorer people that went to that went to the dog racing and um, I think that's probably why uh, and, and it's, it's, a, it's a kind of different the structure of its structure of it's different it's more easy it's 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 easier to actually i think educate people not to support um dog racing because um they kind of go to dog racing just for a night out whereas with horse racing people treat it kind of more as a, a kind of a, a bigger event i think um and that's why and there is more money in it it is you know the people involved in it are uh, are more wealthy and mm. so it's been able to survive um, better than dog racing. It's easier to protest outside a greyhound track than a horse racing track because there are far more people attending horse race meetings so protesters would be more likely to be attacked um, at the horse racing gatherings. Mm. I'd love to know of the people attending either species um, being forced to race, um, how many people actually know that they're killed as a result 
when it comes to greyhounds, it's what 10,000 in the UK, I believe that, you know, quote unquote vanish each year throughout the whole process of the recruiting mm-hmm. if, as it were. So the, 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 the problem is the main problem. Uh, and this is with uh, horse racing as well as greyhound racing is the greyhounds and horses that are killed before they even race because about half of the number that are bred aren't suitable. And that's where the biggest death toll comes. People don't realize that because there's a lot of talk about, especially with greyhounds, about greyhounds being rehomed after they come off the track. But the ones that actually get to race, in a sense, are the lucky ones because they've survived the culling process of the of, mm-hmm. of the young dogs. Exactly the same with horse racing. With horse racing, it's about 10,000. Um, I think with greyhound racing, it may be less now because the industry is so much smaller. So there is much less demand now for um, for, for greyhounds to be bred and so fewer end up being killed. Yeah, and to Brad's point, I think just from a general outreach perspective, I found, I mean, it is a bit speciesist in and of itself, but almost tapping into like almost starting with horses and dogs and seeing what people's thoughts are around using them and then building on to other species, I found is quite a good tactic. So especially here in Brighton, I mean, we have both in a short distance um, of us from where I do outreach. So it's quite like, you know, a few miles away from here. Here's what happens. How do you feel about that? Yeah, so. because at one time within in the animal rights movement, when, when we started Greyhound Action, which was in about 97, um, a lot of people in the animal rights movement said, well, why are you campaigning against that? That's just dogs running around the track and they enjoy it. And so why is, why is it an issue? And we had to explain to people in the animal rights movement about what happened to the dogs because there wasn't an awareness. There was no movement. In fact, the movement in the USA against Greyhound Racing started before the one in the UK, which is quite unusual because most of the kind of animal rights stuff uh, kind of seems to start in the UK first. But with greyhound racing, it wasn't the, the, the campaigns in the USA. And there's been a lot of success in the USA with uh, closing tracks. Did, did you uh, say ni- 1997, Ronnie? Yes. Oh, that, yeah. you're, just, you're, you're just lying, aren't you? Because we know the movement didn't exist until two, 2018. <laughs> Oh yes, that's right. Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was lying. Yeah. <laughs> I was lying. Yeah, and there was no animal liberation plan or anything. That was all made up. Do individuals in the grassroots movement need more empowerment? The one way of empowering them would be to sort out the finances of the movement, and that would inevitably, for me at least, mean taking away the the wealth or the power of the national group, or at least. Um, affecting the national group system in some way because at the moment you know we've got um, we've got so many people who are who are waged at the moment and then now we've got the the entrepreneurs that a lot of vegan money is being tied up in into kind of power centers and so it can't get out to the grassroots and we've never really built to figure out a way of distributing it and it'd be really good if we could you know I mean, I agree it would be great to have a different funding structure, but I guess the question back to you, Roger, how, how, how do you redistribute things from the national groups, the entrepreneurs, as you, as you put them, and so forth? Well, I think there's substantial problems here, Jeremy, because um, there's, all, there's all kinds of things. There's sociological problems, um, but there's psychological problems in the sense that people almost like assume that because there's a national group, that they're kind of staffed by experts, and, and so uh, there's a, this issue about, well, where do I give my money? And then if you think to things like, if you're going to get money from things like legacies, and people like to leave a legacy, and so that means that they're going to look for um, stability. They're going to look for an organization which is going to last. Whereas if they think, well, what's the point of me giving 10,000 pounds or whatever to something that I don't even know is going to be there in three years? So, so the, the, there's... Um, there's a kind of structural problem there. But in terms of donations, just actual donations, I've never understood why the grassroots and the rank and file of the movement seem to be more prepared to give money to already rich groups than to ones that are not rich. You know, because, uh, I mean, even, even my group and, you know, Declan's group, Vigo, um, I mean, like, we could... We, I mean, what we do now is, is pretty good, we think, but... It could certainly be improved if we had access to more money. And also, you know, just, just keeping the van, just keeping the vehicle on the road can be a struggle. And it's the same for a lot of the subgroups. And so if they, if they had that kind of weight taken off them, as well as then having a, a thing where we try to empower uh, people, 
you know, I, I saw, um, I saw a recent, uh, video, I think it only out about a couple of days with, with Pamela and Lynn Sawyer. And they were talking about how the current, the current system is kind of disempowering, you know, it creates a passive membership. And, you know, Ronnie himself, you know, he says that if you're not vegan, go vegan. If you're vegan, become active. And if you're active, become an organizer. Now, we, we, need, we need to encourage that, that move from one to the other. You know, at the moment, the, the movement doesn't seem to be geared up to do that, I don't think. Uh, so I work at an organization called Animal Charity Evaluators. And we have, every year we have these uh, charity uh, recommendations where we recommend uh, kind of the, the national groups uh, that uh, you were just talking about that uh, I think that have like uh, already a lot of resources. And we basically don't um, uh, encourage people to donate to those because they have like a lot of room for more funding. Um, and a concern about that is that uh, the smaller groups don't have any um, potential to get uh, funding as well. So it would be like, we're recommending donations to these larger organizations already uh, to make them grow, but uh, we really don't think that these small number of organizations are the only ones that we should be uh, giving funding for. Um, and um, we really would like to give more funding to a wide variety of approaches and not just um, uh, like the, the Humane League and the, the Good Food Institute and the ones that we typically recommend. So that is why we started the Defective Animal Advocacy Fund, uh, which I'm running. Um, but I would really like to see more um, approaches that are very much about uh, like making bold asks and uh, having uh, like more of, of a liberationist um, approach uh, and kind of things that would that are not covered yet by our uh, recommended charities. I mean, I'd like I'd like to see some type of fund. I mean, I, I actually contacted somebody t uh, to ask about what the situation was with Philip Woolen. And not that I was asking the guy for money because he, he gets enough of that. More to do with whether he had the kind of organizational structure or knowledge in order to kind of set up a kind of grassroots fund. See, it's not just money. I mean, I think Ronnie would say it's not just money. It's to do with, with other things as well. We need, we need to kind of create a culture yeah. which is grassroots focused, it seems to me. So uh, that is kind of the distinction between the EA fund and the recommended charities is that um, if we are recommending... Uh, like the, the impact of our recommended of our charity recommendations could be like millions of dollars. And if, if we recommend a small organization with maybe, uh, yeah, they may not have like the, the, the room to use all that funding, or there would be a lot of funding uh, at one time to, um, mm. to like use. So would, that's would, why we have the EAA fund to kind of yeah. bridge that, that gap. I mean, would, would you need criteria, for example, would the groups that you give to have to have staff members, for example? Or would you just have to, I mean, like, for example, you can probably see Declan Bowens on the screen there. And he's been doing a weekly event in Dublin City Centre for coming up to six and a half years now. Every single week, I think we missed about four weeks in six years. And so would it have to be a staffed group that you gave to or could it just be anybody? For the EA fund, uh, we try to, to include everybody. Uh, there are some like considerations about like whether ACE can actually grant to them because we are a 501c3 so we have certain tax uh, regulations to be uh, uh, like compliant with uh, mm. but we do aim to like just if it's a good project we we try to fund it and also outside of the, the US because a lot of resources are um, based in the US. And that's a big question because uh, talking here it almost sounds like we need an organization who can handle the big donations that almost distributes it to the grassroots because i agree when you start sending to individual local locales it's going to be hard to manage where it's going to but if you had a central body i'm not putting my hand up to figure all this stuff out by the way but it sounds great in theory you know yeah you haven't got, you haven't got anything else to do jeremy but the point is <laughs> i mean i mean i agree i agree with you because that's always i mean obviously you've got to have some kind of oversight system here because a lot of people over the years have objected to this idea because they think, well, the money is going to be wasted. Now, on the one hand, that is a, a genuine problem that would have to be managed. On the other hand, they tend to forget that there's a lot of money now being wasted right now in the movement. 
there's millions of pounds and dollars and euros being wasted. And I've always said that if you've got all the staff of all the groups, and there's more staff and more groups now than, than ever, and you line them all up, and they, they had their salaries and their job titles, I think we would be really shocked by it, about the amount of duplication that goes on. You know, because duplication is, is um, I mean, duplication on the grassroots level, that's okay, because you're, you're dealing with your own community, but, but duplication on a national or international level doesn't make any sense. But the groups, the groups won't kind of collaborate because they want their logo on everything. So they've got to have their own range of T-shirts and their own range of posters, their own range of, of leaflets. Uh, so just to speak to that point about um, organisation and, um, you know, the, the idea of who decides who gets what funding, those kinds of things. I think this is probably the, one of our biggest problems right now. Um, particularly, like you say, because a lot of the money is being funneled into these national groups and they won't play together. Like they won't team up on a campaign. They won't support the grass uh, roots movement. So it does make me wonder whether as a grassroots community, we should kind of pressure campaign them and say, well, right, come on then. If, if we're all in it for the animals, let's all of us do this thing. And if you don't, well, then that speaks volumes. So I think where the grassroots movement kind of needs financing is, is so that we've got more resources to set up more um, local groups. I think one, one of the problems with the grassroots movement and people campaigning locally in their, in their communities is, is that there are so many areas where there aren't groups. And so, you know, there's no education towards the local public. There's no campaigning in those uh, in those local areas um, and in order I think in order to to set those groups up and, and get them going really needs um, really needs a very hands-on approach and so we could do with people who kind of work full-time uh, doing that and those people would need funding they need to have some sort of wage otherwise all their time I mean for instance in our in our local vegan group we got this great guy he's a great campaigner great activist and um, he's having to work, um, you know, he's, he's having to work full time uh, at a very tiring job to earn really quite a low wage to keep himself going. Uh, and it's a, a really, it's such a waste of, of somebody that could, that could actually do, do that job that I've spoken about. It'd be somebody that went and helped to set up groups. And, and I'm sure there's lots of other people like that. And, and I think that's probably the main area where um where kind of funding is needed or, or at least a very important area where funding is needed and and it's it, it's a it's a question of like working out how can we how can we get more money into the into the grassroots i think you know one of the ways would be to have a um a, net, a network of uh, activist local groups that could kind of um have money have money given to it as a network and then distribute that money and that's something that that Roger and I have been working on getting in the very early stages of getting such a network um, set up on Facebook so local groups can communicate with one another and you know share information share resources um, because I think people would probably be more willing to give money to that than to individual groups and then the, then the money could be uh, could be shared out to groups that need it or used to actually employ people to go around um, coordinating stuff and helping to set up new groups. And yeah, I also wanted to clarify when you're talking about the grassroots that, um, I mean, I, I, I agree with that, but I would also like to say that uh, there's a lot of, uh, because I'm coming from the Bosnia and I'm the president of the Vegan Society of Bosnia and we have, for example, it's pretty similar in Croatia and um, other Balkanian countries, you have, you don't have institutional support like you have in the European Union or maybe in states. So our organizations would mostly rely on the other fundings from the other organizations almost exclusively and just by the donations. As you know, we don't have that, how to say, um, institutional support or uh, support from the government, for example. And then you have the movement that isn't really growing, uh, isn't really following the global animal rights movement.
Yes, so the, the Effective Animal Advocacy Fund is basically for any type of promising projects that are being uh, underfunded in the, that we see as underfunded in the, in the animal advocacy space. So that could include uh, projects in countries where there is not uh, a very well-funded animal advocacy movement uh, or approaches in, in the US uh, or in Western Europe um, uh, that are not uh, receiving enough funding yet. Oh, well, uh, nothing is receiving enough funding, but that receive even less funding. I agree 100% with Ronnie, what he was saying about, um, you know, we need hands-on approach to help people set up different groups in different areas. Like with me and Roger, um, you know, some weeks we have four people, maybe six people. Other weeks we could have maybe 15 people. But um, to, 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 the big thing is to encourage these other people to, you know, we could have we could have 15 people say, but we can run the table ourselves, you know, with four or six people, no problem. So these other people we'd have are on the fringes, kind of, they don't get a chance to talk to many people to the public. So we, we, we try to encourage them to, you know, to, to set up tables themselves, but that's where the funding for groups like ours would come in because we, we could buy tables and posters and TVs and, uh, you know, get leaflets printed and all sorts of stuff like that to, to, to help them get going. But a big problem is, I think, too, that uh, to uh, uh, incentivize these people or to, uh, you know, to get them started, uh, uh, you know, like Ronnie says, yeah, you would need people to stand with them to, to, um, to, to make them feel cool on the street and, and you know, just to be there for, for a, a few weeks to, uh, you know, to answer some questions that people might put at them, that, that, you know, just to back them up kind of thing. Ronnie, Ronnie is 100% on, and I know Roger the same, but, but ex exactly stuff like that we need, you, you know. But, but, and also, also I think uh, in Ireland we, we have lots of vegan groups, you know, with, with groups in Cork and Kerry and all sorts of places and hundreds and thousands of people in these, these groups. But, you know, myself and Roger and a few others went to different cities and towns and we've done, we done outreach in these cities, but very few, no one has come forward to set up these outreach, group, outreach groups on a weekly basis or a monthly basis in any of these cities or towns. So I wonder what's wrong with people that they don't, uh, you know, um, have the gumption in them sort of a thing to, to go out and do this themselves. You know, and, and stand, you know, all you need is one other person to stand with you. When I, when I set up Vigo at the start, I just put a, a, a post out in Dublin Vegans and it, it, it was a, one person answered, it was an English woman that was, that was going to college in Dublin and she said she'd love to come along. So, so when I went along on the day, she, she was waiting for me when I appeared on the street. So that's how I started at the Vigo group. So, you know, I wonder what's wrong with people that they don't feel, um, feel it in their power that, that they can do this. Like, it's so easy to do, like, like, like e e even without funding, like, 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 you know, a sm small amount of funding. All you need is the computer and a printer, to, you know, you can make your own posters and you can print your own leaflets. So. Well, it's a bit of a personality thing, though, Declan, you know, like, uh, you know, you, you, you know, you know your stuff, you were born on a dairy farm, you, 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 yeah. you know, you know it, you know, and um, as we know, when farmers come up and learn that you also have a farming background, they, they hate that because they know now that you know what you're talking about. And so there, there would be that kind of confidence issue. There's kind of like personality issues and psychological issues, but there's also um, a more kind of fundamental thing, which... Um, I think when Lynn Sawyer comes, we go, we're going to invite uh, Pamela and Lynn to, to talk a little bit because in their recent podcast, they talked about how we have a system that seems to disempower people and make them passive. And I, I'd like to explore that with them. But I think that's part of it. You know, so it's a complicated issue. It's, it, it's not just a question of turning the tap on and kind of the, the funding is there. I mean, I know that you've given tables and posters to, to, to people and they've gone and you've never seen them again. You know, so, so it needs some kind of control, uh, some foresight, some planning. It can't just be done uh, very easily, I don't think, but it, it kind of still needs to be done. That's, that's yeah. my view. 
Yeah, but I think Roger, Ronnie is 100% right there that we need, you know, uh, more people that are doing it on a regular basis to stand beside these people. Yeah. No, me and you have done it, but, but the ones we have stood beside, you know, on, on different cities, they haven't come out and kept Yeah, but as you, as you say, we, we've, gone, we've gone to their areas, we've done it with them, and, but yeah. they haven't carried on, so you've got to work that bit out as well. Thank you for watching this episode of Common Ground. As I mentioned at the beginning, this was quite a long recording session, and we set a new record, so it's being divided into three parts. So if you want to see those other parts, be sure to hit that subscribe button and follow us on social media. We also want to have the most diverse representation of the animal advocate community as possible, so please share our Facebook events, and you may want to consider using that Facebook invite friends feature so we can be sure this is getting to as many animal advocates as possible. Thanks for watching, be sure to share your thoughts in the comments, and we'll see you in the next one.